Hey everybody, ABC 10 meteorologist Brendan Minchef here. It is the weekend. Time for another drought update. Uh, there has not been a single change to the drought monitor since last week. All the numbers are the same. Uh, I mean, we really haven't seen anything in the way of rainfall here in California in about a week. So uh, makes sense. 44% of the state still in that severe drought category. This is that orange color. 28% of the state in the extreme drought. That's the red color that goes through the Sacramento Valley all the way up to the Oregon border. And then the exceptional drought category, 13% and mostly in the San Joaquin Valley, right around Fresno is the bullseye there. Uh, we are starting to fall a little bit further behind since we haven't seen any rain for the last really half of November. Uh, total so far is almost an inch of rain. That's from the start of the water year in Sacramento, just over an inch and a half in South Lake Tahoe. Uh, but again, we are falling behind. We need some rain. Fortunately, looks like there might be some yeah, just, just around the corner. We'll get to that in a second. But if we're looking for some good news, this is what the drought monitor looked like a year ago with 52% of the state in the extreme category, that red color, 28% in the darker red color, the highest level. So when we compare that to what it looks like right now, at least we are in better shape than we were exactly one year ago. So again, we'll, uh, we'll take the silver lining there. Uh, but if we want to completely eliminate the drought, it's going to take a lot of rain. An average water year is about 53 inches of rain in the Sierra. This is a uh, eight station index and that average is about 53.2 inches of rain. So far, only about 4.3 inches uh, have fallen. Now this is uh, liquid, I should say, liquid precipitation. So that's snow melt, not snow, not how many inches of snow we've seen, but that is snow melt. So that's taking that into account right now, 4.3 inches. Uh, and again, this is calculated by adding the precipitation deficits over the previous three water years. That's what that number is. So if we want to bust the drought, if we want to get rid of it pretty much completely, it's going to take about double an average water year. And especially in a La Nina year, seems pretty unlikely. Our record wettest water year was 2016 to 17. We saw 94.7 inches. So we would need a record wet year uh, to really look at busting our California drought. We're going to get some help, but it's not going to be drought busting by any means. As we look at the weather pattern for this last week in November, first few days of December, here's November 28th. This is Monday. Little bit of snow in the Sierra. Really, I mean a little bit of snow, only an inch, maybe two inches of snow. Uh, that's about it. That's all we're looking at in the valley. Looks to stay pretty much entirely dry across the valley. But another system arrives Thursday, December 1st. This one brings a much better chance of rain to the valley and a much better chance of snow to the Sierra. But here's the really good news. It looks like we'll have another system on the back end that brings us another shot of rain and snow by the time we get through the first weekend of December. And so some estimates here of what we could see by the time we get to Sunday, December 4th, about a week from now, about four inches or more of liquid precip in the mountains. Again, this is taking into effect the liquid amounts, not the snow amounts, but four inches of liquid precip uh, in the Sierra, two inches or more uh, in the valley, in the Sacramento Valley, about an inch or more in the San Joaquin Valley. Look at the coastal ranges, kind of similar story as the Sierra, three inches or more. Again, of liquid water, that's good news, but it's not just Northern California. Southern California getting in on the action too, could see about three inches just north of Los Angeles. So some help on the way in terms of rainfall. Uh, looks like we could see, if we're lucky, about two to three inches of rainfall in the valley by the time we get to next week. And again, four inches or more of liquid water in the Sierra. That's good news. We always talk about how much we need water used for a variety of uses, agriculture, uh, household uses, ecological uses, and of course for hydropower as well. SMUD, one of the companies out here that actually cloud seeds so that we get more snowpack and then more snow melt into their hydroelectric dams, giving them more renewable uh, energy to use. But I want to focus on something different this week. We haven't really talked a lot about the ecological impacts uh, of water in the West, of snowpack, of snow melt, of rivers, of diverting water from rivers. So let's talk about it. And we went straight to the fishy source. That would be Trout Unlimited to talk about uh, how everything we do with water, again, from diverting to snowmelt to snowpack to rain in the winter, how that impacts fish and why that is so important. Our mission is to protect, reconnect, and restore cold water fisheries. Uh, we're the nation's largest cold water conservation organization. So basically, um, we're based out of D.C. We work nationwide. Uh, our office here 
uh, is in um, our program in California is based out of Emeryville. We've got a variety of programs that work on salmon, steelhead, and I personally work on inland trout. And so one of the things that's interesting about now is that most years for a salmon look like a quote unquote drought year. Like they look like a historically dry year uh, because so much water gets diverted from our rivers for other purposes, whether it's, you know, agriculture or human consumption in urban areas. So the way that salmon populations in the Central Valley especially have worked in the last couple decades is basically they decline, they decline, they decline, they decline, they decline, and then we get a big water year, the dams spill, and there's a whole bunch of floodplain habitat that's created, a lot of the little fish survive, and then that like brings the population back up a notch. Salmon and trout are what's known as keystone species. When the salmon and trout do better, the rest of the ecosystem is doing better. When their populations are hurting, other species typically suffer as well. They're such an important species to the ecosystem. If you, you lose them, you start to lose the other pieces. And, um, you know, you can see that in some of these places that we work in where, um, you know, the dynamics of a trout population will change or you'll bring in a, another invasive species, another, another type of trout that's non-native to here and how that changes the native population and also the macroinvertebrates and the other aquatic species that, you know, depend on, on that sort of balance. Everything gets shifted. So how much do winter rains help the salmon population? They help them a lot, you know, I mean, uh, to like complete the life cycle. So these fish will, you know, come up in the fall and spawn, lay their eggs, and then they die, provide this huge nutrient input to the system. Like they've grown in the ocean, which is like where all life is from. And then they bring all this ocean nitrogen in their bodies and leave them in these inland areas and fertilize the rivers. Um, so, uh, and then their eggs will emerge in the springtime, swim out to the ocean and then be there for two to five years. These years, these days, it's usually two or three years. Um, and when they are out in the ocean hanging out, one of the cues for them to come up into the river is often uh, rain, is often cold water. Yeah, they're really dependent on water temperature and they have got some, you know, requirements, specific requirements on temperature and dissolved oxygen. And so when you start to change those pieces of their habitat, you'll lose fish pretty quickly. Part of protecting the fish is to restore high altitude cold water meadows. These meadows can also help us humans out as well by protecting our water supply as snowpack melts earlier in the season. Trout Unlimited is also working on projects in the valley. There's a lot of work right now to restore all that really productive juvenile rearing habitat that's been lost. And that restoration is often really um, compatible with agriculture. Like you might've heard, there's a lot of great work growing salmon on flooded rice fields. Those flooded rice fields were once wetlands and are still functioning in that way. They're now just growing a wetland crop that we like to eat. So I think a lot of what we do, you know, water is, um, it's, in, you know, it's like, Water is a, is a is a resource that everything depends on. It's so central to life. And so a lot of trying to figure out how to recover fish is looking for efficiencies where water can benefit a range of life simultaneously in the way that it does in the, the productive ecosystems in the world. There's also a lot of policy related to management of ecosystems like can we um looking at efficiencies with our flood system can we set back levees and create more flood safety by setting back levees and also use those flooded areas to develop new wetlands to inundate floodplains to grow fish whether you're a fish a plant or a person you need water we're all in this together but it can be tough to reconcile all of the agricultural, ecological, and economical sides to the water issue. So that's exactly where you can find Renee working hardest. As I'm sure you know, there's a lot of just tension around water and in the Central Valley. Water for fish, water for farms, and, uh, and a lot of legal battle around 
yeah, around who gets the resource and when and why. And uh, there's also a lot of sort of conflict around science and people are, you know, insulting each other's science. And um, like, I don't think we get anywhere without everyone. You know, it's sort of like we're all in this together and there's no magic switch that we flip where like the people who have different perspectives than us go away and the world just becomes really simple and easy. And that wouldn't be a very resilient world anyway. Like diverse systems are much stronger. Um, so I'm excited to be working uh, in a more collaborative way with some of the people who have traditionally been on the other side of some of this stuff.